Welcome to the Mentors by Design podcast. In this show, Fine Design CEO Victor Kostrup brings ideas and inspiration through thought-provoking conversations with entrepreneurs and experts. Whether you're just getting started on your journey or are a seasoned business owner, this show is designed to give you insight into what it takes to succeed. Here's your host, Victor Kostrup. Hey guys, Victor here, and it's another episode of Mentors by Design. 2022 reminded us that the world is constantly changing, especially in the realm of work. Over a crazy 12 months, we saw the pandemic swing from the great resignation and quiet quitting to economic slowdown that we'd all like to quickly see disappear. But alongside every twist and turn came powerful new insights from the latest science that can help us adapt, grow, and thrive. And to help us do that, I invited one of the best experts in the field of finance, Ken Goldberg. Ken is an investment advisor with four decades of broad investment and trading experience. He was number one read analyst contributed at the street.com. And when he left with 1 million views per month, is a financial podcaster and a book author. Ken, welcome. We are so honored to have you today on our podcast. Hey, thank you so much. It's great to be here and happy 2023. Oh, same to you. I want to ask you questions. It's just that it's in the minds of millions of people. Is the worst over or is it about to get really ugly in the economy? Because we just turned to 2023. Yeah, great question. And it is on the minds of everyone who's not only invested through their 401k or their IRA or even just regular accounts, but those people who have businesses, run businesses, and need a strong economy in order to thrive. So great question. First day of the year is a great time to look at it. And sadly, the answer is it's unlikely that it's over. We here at at C Trading, we study the markets further back than most people. Um, Unfortunately, most investors don't really want to take the time to do their own research. So they rely on others, financial websites, news programs, you know, stockbrokers to right. to do the homework. And that works sometimes and other times it doesn't. So what we do is we study the market behavior going back 300 years to the early 1700s before the American New York Stock Exchange and stock market was developed. We study British stock prices because they go back hundreds of years. So then we we put that all together and we've developed these algorithms that search 300 years of data for repeating patterns. Mm, interesting. And yeah, and it turns out that, you know, since there's hundreds of millions of people that invest all at the same time, we act the same, right? We're all human. We have right. 99.9% of the same makeup and we think and act the same. And uh, we can see that in the prices of investment asset classes, whether it's real estate, stocks, bonds, gold, Bitcoin, you know, collector cars, it, it doesn't matter. If there's something that everyone is involved in or many people are, then the behavior of this crowd of people can be tracked. And our algorithms go back and look for repeating patterns of that behavior. So when the algorithms find that that pattern, because we can go back so many centuries now, we can see what happened after that pattern. Mm -hmm. So when we see these blow off stock markets, like we saw from, 2009 to 2021 and you know into the 1987 peak and into the 2000 peak and et cetera, into the 1929 peak, et cetera, we can see what came after those types of straight up crazy mania, you know, buy at any price types of situations. 
And what shows is that when the bubble bursts, and I think most of us can agree that some bubble burst early in 2022, right? When the stock market had its peak and no matter what happened throughout 2022, no matter how many people said, well, it's over now, that's it. The Fed's going to save it. The patterns continue to fall. Yeah, and, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. And we all, we're all caught up in that. If you're in the market, you're caught up in that decline. And, uh, you know, people want to hear that it's over and it's time to buy and it's going to be better. But and I'd love to be able to say that right here and right now. And unfortunately, history shows that it's not done and that 2023 is not going to be a, a fun year. And somewhere around late 2023 to early 2024, so let's say, you know, 10 to 16 months from now, that's when we likely will see a low in, in the markets. And the markets usually produce a low in advance of the economy. So let's say a year from now, the markets come into a low. Well, then the economy probably won't put in its low until later 2024. That's really what the, the history is showing us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, from standpoint of the regular buyer who is looking to buy, you know, and invest in their real estate, what they paying attention to, obviously, is the interest rate. And if it's higher than 7% or even higher than 6%, you know, that's scary. And so we all want to know, are, can we expect the interest rate, you know, lowering by the end of the 2023? Another great question. So what we're probably going to see is a peak in interest rates in the first quarter or so of 2023. Right. We've been interest rates have been rising since early 2020. If you remember around March of 2020, interest rates bottomed at their lowest rate in, right. you know, in 40 years. Right. They peaked in 1980 and they've been falling and they bottomed in, in 2020. So that's 40 years of decline and they've been straight up ever since. And it's only been a year of the past three years of rising interest rates that the Fed has begun to tighten. The Fed never leads interest rates. They don't set policy. The Fed follows what the market interest rate is doing. So the market, Oh, really? Wow. I never knew that. Yeah. So think about it. The market bottoms its rates. Let's use the 10 year interest rate because a lot of things are set off that the, the 10 year interest rate bottomed at around 0.4, 40 basis points in March of 2020, the lowest interest rate on the 10 year ever seen. And it then went straight up and got to 4.3%, you know, earlier this fall. It went from 0.4 to 4.3. It almost went up 400 basis points. That's wow. a mind-boggling amount of interest rate rise, as you know, right? in a short period of time. But yeah. the Fed didn't start to tighten until a year ago. And so what's interesting is that the, the Fed is on this interest rate tightening policy. And as you know, since about October, interest rates have started to back off a little bit. Well, the Fed tightened twice since then. So they're continuing to tighten while the market interest rate is coming down. So that shows that the Fed does not lead interest rates. They have a meeting, they look around. If interest rates are high and their Fed funds rate is low, then they raise rates. Mm -hmm. If rates start to fall, they'll look around and they'll say, oh, we need to lower interest rates. So I don't expect them to stop tightening uh, probably for another year. I see. So is the inflation, is that part of the main reason why we they have to, I mean, we see this inflation in the market? Well, again, there's so many different ways that the government defines different words like inflation and recession that it confuses all of us right we've been <laughs> we've been told yeah. that, that they're raising interest rates because of inflation well that's inflation, right inflation means rising prices that's right and and that kind of stopped about a year ago right because what have what have yeah. housing prices been doing for the past year they've been yeah. 
then falling. dropping them and yeah. losing the value. Yeah. Yeah. And rents are falling and used car prices are falling. And, you know, oil, which peaked at $130 a barrel in early 2022, well, oil is now at $80 a barrel. So that's not inflation. In fact, that's deflation. That's recession wow. when prices are falling. I mean, look at lumber uh, down yeah, 80%, yeah. all the commodities. So even though we're told inflation is crazy and that's why they're going to continue to to hike rates, look at gas prices. They're no longer $6 a gallon anymore. Yeah. You know, I just saw them at Costco yesterday for three twenty five a gallon. So we have to be careful that we don't let the news that's blasting us in the face every day um, take control of our common sense. If you think about it, the news is the noise. And we need to hear and see through that so that we can get a clear plan for what we should do. So our interest rates done rising. They're going to back off, you know, sometime later in 2023. But the rest of this decade, interest rates are going much higher than the 4% level. Wow. I'm just like, this is so educational for, for me. I'm just about to, to write every sentence you just said. But especially, <laughs> especially, like you said, the meaning behind this, that's the play with different words, whether this is inflation or recession, because definitely recession, that's a very, very scary word. And we would do anything to avoid that. But inflation, it's still kind of like positive because in a sense you're, yeah, it's the interest rate goes up, but then you have the value, whether this is the, your collector of the cars or you invest it in a gold or real estate, then you know you have the value there. But if a recession, the value is losing. So it's definitely not what we're hearing from the news and but i completely agree with you because that was that was my question because that was my question i'm also investing in a lot of different things and at first the when i heard the news this is the inflation it was kind of incentive for me hey the, you just need to invest more but mm. then it didn't make sense when everything started falling exactly i think an interesting way to think about it because we study things from a crowd psychology perspective is that the mood of the crowd determines the prices it's not really the fundamentals that people think you know people think okay well like you just said inflation okay i gotta buy some stuff because the prices are going to inflate so i'm going to buy stocks and real estate and some ferraris or something and <laughs> sometime in right. the future i'll sell all that stuff it's based on our mood and so when we're happy as a crowd when we're secure in our job, when we're happy with our relationship, when our money is growing, we're in a good mood. We buy stuff. That's the right. The problem is, is very few of us are trained in looking for when the red flags start to show up. When I do the see. warning signs occur? And that's really where we help our clients is warning about the warning. Like we would use a great example a year ago bitcoin you know peaked at 67 69000 and everyone was thinking 100000 maybe a million that's and right and so they were borrowing money from their houses and taking out you know home equity loans and taking money from their stock funds to buy bitcoin and nobody was thinking about what straight up looks like except for us because we study straight up patterns and we know that that's anything that goes straight up often comes straight, straight down, sadly. So right. the key is to have a level in mind where enough is enough, or at least enough is enough for now, or maybe I should take half off the table. Or if I, if I have, you know, seven investment real estate properties, maybe I should sell three and keep four, you know, because we're all caught in this greed, this manic kind of contest to be richer than someone else and bigger <laughs> and so you know so it's human nature we can't help it yeah um, so yeah. understanding that it's here can open up a window into ourselves into our own portfolios into our own wealth to say you know what it's been a great 12 years of of bull market i've made money in everything you know my wealth is up tenfold or fivefold since 2009 maybe i should you know take a break or protect myself and so it's really important i think 
that people understand that some of this decision making has to come from inside ourselves. You know, we can't rely on someone else to protect our money. Right. Just like you said, that the funny way we're making the decision is by looking what the crowd does. Like, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I'm talking about my, my business. We're selling event merchandise on site at the sporting events. And I remember one event in specifically that a salesperson have called me and said, because we, for uh, certain events, we give them free t-shirts. Uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, regular white t-shirts, but the, by statistic, it shows that people will use that as a credit to upgrade to other more expensive items like uh, sweatshirts, jackets and stuff. But this crowd, they, um, the line was created and uh, one person said, oh no, I don't, I, you're not gonna, in other words, you're not gonna get me into buy more stuff. I'm a smart buyer and therefore just get me that white t-shirt that comes for free. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the line basically followed that. They, you know, the, the crowd atmosphere was created. And so everyone, no, just get me that. So the salesperson calls the office and said, what am I going to do? Because I'm out, out of this regular white t-shirts. I'm stuck with everything else, but nobody is buying anything. So what I said to that salesperson, I said, I, what I need you to do is I need you to, to make a break, come up with any reason, just close the shop and go away for 20 minutes. Once you come back, all you have to do is just to sell one, one single item, ex uh, not, just not a t-shirt, but something else, just mm -hmm. once for one single customer. Can you do that? You definitely had a lot of doubts that this is going to change. Once mm -hmm. he sell that one item, everybody follow that mm -hmm. notion of, uh, yeah, this is, it must be a right thing to do. It must be smart since upgrading and it's a, there is a, a better value to upgrade and everybody follow that. So it was the record created out of that single event. So I know from my personal experience, I know from business experience, but that leads me to another question is we know that like Warren Buffett and a lot of different people recommend that you want to invest not when the crowd says oh yeah let's invest let's keep buying but when the it's opposite when things are not going well in market when things are down that's where you want to invest is that's what you recommend now or this is not the time yet it is what we recommend but this is not the time yet right? I because see. everyone is everyone is still buying everyone i is, see that's why because everybody's still buying yeah and, and for instance in the real estate market you'll see people putting their houses for sale because they're a little nervous but they're putting them for sale at last year's all-time high prices they're not sensitive to the fact that the markets change so their houses are sitting on the market longer and right. builders as well they're now coming online with all these properties that they've been working on. And what was a seller's market where the seller could name any price they wanted because everyone was in such panic to buy, it's now turning into a buyer's market where the buyers are in control, right? So you see a house for a million dollars and of course you want to offer, you know, 850 just to see if the seller is strong or weak. And if the seller doesn't come down to 850, you back away. And a couple of months later, you know, you go back at 750 and pretty soon the seller says, okay, I'll take last year's 850 offer. Well, now, you know, they're weak and, and right. you don't want to buy it at 750. So if you think of it as a pendulum that swings from the left to the right, on the left is mania, exuberance, excitement, you know, on the right is depression, sadness, nervousness, fear. And we just left in, in 2021 at the all time high in stocks and bonds and houses and Bitcoin. We just left this manic decade of buy anything because everything's going up. Right. And we're only one year past that. Right. So we market went up from 09 to 21, right? 11 or 12 years. And we've been going down for one year. 
So that's not really in balance yet. Typically, a recession is going to last, well, for the past 100 years, recessions average about 2.4 years. So about, you know, two years and, and three months or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, average. Yeah. And we're like 10 months into a recession, maybe even less. So we have mm -hmm. at least a year, maybe 15, 16, 18 months, if, if it's a bad one, of continued decline of more unemployment, of falling prices, of stocks going down and our 401ks getting uglier. And yeah, if you're if you're stuck in houses, you thought you were going to be selling, right, you better get your offers lower, you know, mm -hmm. because the mood is dark. And when the mood is dark, we sell stuff. Yeah. And, and that's another behavior. And now every, you know, once it's becomes kind of like, because like you said, people are still buying, but the, once the mood is changed and everybody will want to sell, that is the big negative again. So eventually it should rebound, right? Once the recession, we pass the recession, it should rebound, right? Should we expect that? Yes. There will be an incredible buying opportunity somewhere about two years out from now what what's happening is you know we've all heard about the, uh, the baby boomers and the baby boomers are getting old so that massive hundred million plus group of people are no longer looking to buy more stuff right they're right. turning you know 65 70 and now they're consolidating they're moving from four bedroom, five bedroom houses to nice condos. They're downsizing. They're not spending massive amounts of money taking their entire family to Europe, right? They're not going, six people aren't going to Europe anymore. Just the <laughs> husband and wife are, right? Because yeah, the kids- Yeah, yeah the exactly kids have their right, own, yeah. Yeah, the kids have their own lives. So we're in the middle of two big growth spurts of population. The baby boomers are starting to retire and consolidate and think about, you know, conserving and the millennials haven't quite gotten wealthy enough to take over on the spending path. That's right. And about 2025, so in about two years or so, the millennials start to get into the age of spending where they're buying second houses and they're putting kids through college and they're buying cars for their kids, right? So somewhere in the next couple of years, we want to start buying stocks and buying houses again because we want to get in the way of the millennials now starting to spend like crazy we're just in that we're in between the storms of buying really I so see. we don't want to rush we don't want right. to rush too soon well this is a lot of lot of good information especially if you listen in now my friend and it's the beginning of the year it's it, the advice that we just get in from ken is so valuable so valuable i could see a lot of rich people <laughs> two years from now or three years from now we'll we'll hear new testimonies the people who in, make the right investment following this advice and then keeping that later with much better position for money they invested anyway what should my listeners do if they want more specific and personal help from you, Ken? Well, they can contact me at ken at dsetrading.com and let us know how we can help them. Great. One of the biggest things that people need to realize is that their current plan may not be the best for their wealth. Here's what I mean by that. If you're if you're looking at your portfolio and you're down 40% or more, if you're down 30 to 40% or more, your advisor is not helping you. Mm -hmm. So you might want to question where you're getting your advice and maybe you want to open your mind to looking for a different type of advice and help. A lot of people say, well, you're down as much, everyone's down 40%. So what difference does it make? Well, yeah, it that's, makes the, a lot of, that's the first excuse you're hearing. Yeah, but it makes a lot of difference for me. I don't care if everyone else is down 40%. If I'm down 40%, I'm down a lot of money. And how am I going to make that back, right? If you're down 40%, you need to grow 75% or 80% just to get back to even. That's, so that's right. hard work. 
So we are happy to help people evaluate their current plan and also to look inside your portfolio and, and be honest with you and say, you know what, you know, you've got 25 different companies you're invested in and only seven of them are good. And the other 18 or however the number is, they are not going to do the makeup work that you're going to need. Ken, everything that you you just mentioned, everything makes sense. And I just even made the note for myself, watch out for the red flags. My second mm -hmm. note, this is not inflation. <laughs> this is recession. Yeah. And I have to watch out because the mistakes we're making, we're following the um, the crowd again we're following the crowd and we just we're not looking for the red flags but what we're looking for is what my neighbors does and if the majority start buying into this we're just going into that behavior and again making mistakes and mistakes but i see that after this podcast people want to get more information possibly get advice, private advice. So what should my listeners do if they want more specific and personal help from you? Thank you for asking. They can reach me at ken at dsetrading.com. And if they just send an email, maybe with their phone number and give me an idea of what their thinking about, we can set up a time and set up a consulting period and just do whatever they need to do to get their questions answered so that they feel comfortable during the next year or two of rough, what rough waters so that they're in the position to be in the right place with capital for the next move up. Because really a bear market, if you think about it, is like spraying hand sanitizer on your hands. As, as you know, the hand sanitizer says it kills 99.9% .9 of germs. Right. Well, a bear market kills 99.9% .9 of investors. And you have to figure out how to stay safe and maintain your capital because every bear market is followed by a bull market. And that's what's coming next, but it's a year or a little bit more away. So it's way too early to buy. It's way too early to buy houses. It's way too early to buy stocks. It's just way too early. We haven't even seen how bad 2023 is going to get. But by the end of 2023, that's when you said earlier, when everybody else is selling, should we be buying? And the answer will be, yeah. But when everyone you talk to refuses to talk about investments, when you're at a party and you ask people, well, hey, I know you're a a housing investor, I know you do in stock investments, and they go, I don't want, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> now you know. That's it, the time to buy. That is the time the to time invest. To wow. Exactly. That's a yeah. great, great advice. That is a great advice. What if, because like I own some stocks, and but it's down by at least 30% now, and yeah. I was waiting, waiting for the things to get back and actually got worse. What do yeah. I do now? Do I just sell at this point where I can recover, recover, or still wait for another year, two years or three years? You know, that's a, it's a great question, and we should probably speak offline about that because some stocks have already crashed, right? If, if you're in Meta or Google or Amazon, those stocks are down 50, 60% already. Right. Other stocks like Microsoft or Apple, they're only down 25%. So they may still have a huge decline coming, whereas some of the others may have already done their worst damage so it's really kind of a stock by stock basis and that's what people would want to get into some time with us one-on-one -on -one so we can look inside their number of i'm down 30 percent well okay depends on what stocks you're in right if you're in a bunch of ipos or things like that that's going to get a lot worse so but, but i think in general people should think that if they do nothing for a year they're going to lose a lot of money in the next year if you do nothing from here, you're going to lose a lot of money in the next year. I see. So there are my, things that yeah, can that be done. That was my question and you answer. But other than that, I need to get the appointment and then yep. go stock by stock. And you can already count me. I'm your client. I'm uh, Excellent. So Because here's what's going to happen. There, sometime in the next month or two, there's probably going to be a bounce. And that little rally, most people are going to think, 
thank God it's over. <laughs> I got to buy a bunch of stocks. The problem is, is 300 years of history shows us that there's always the first decline, which we've had. And then there's a little bounce, which we're going to have. And then there's the final shoe drops. And the final shoe is more like a boot. It hurts. So some of your stocks will take you in particular, Victor. Some of your stocks might be okay. And in this next bounce, maybe that lasts into April or May, you can sell some things out at a higher price than now. Mm -hmm. So it, it just depends on what you have, what your goals are, you know, how much of your liquid net worth is invested in stocks. And we can go over that, you know, with you or any of your listeners that want to explore that with us. Just let us know. Happy to help. Great. Ken, I thank you so much. Thank you for, for your time. I'm, I'm sure we will connect many more times. And like I said, I will be seeking your advice on a daily basis. I want to remind everybody we're part of the Mission Matters. You could listen to us and see other podcasts done by Adam Torres on missionmatters.com. Thank you and good luck. Make wise decision. Thank you, Ken. Happy. Bye-bye. Take care. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Mentors by Design podcast. This show is sponsored by Fine Designs. Learn more about how Fine Designs can supply apparel for your events at finedesigns.com.